Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today, or rather not joining us and uh, self-quarantining and staying home. Uh, this is the first time that I've uh, done this virtual presentation, and so it might be a little bit awkward at first, but uh, bear with me and we'll get through it and I'll try to be as funny as possible. It's been uh, crazy with this quarantine and and all this COVID-19 stuff that's happening and you know we're all trying to get through it one day at a time. I've definitely been fishing less. By less I mean I haven't been fishing which is definitely taking a toll and so I'm tying a lot of flies and spending time at home and doing home stuff and uh, thinking about the good days to come like the salmon fly hatch. And so this presentation of course is a called the Salmon Fly Survival Guide, and I don't know that it's a survival guide, but it's kind of my thoughts and and take on the salmon fly hatch and what I think what I think about and what I think will help us all to get through it or help you to get through it and maybe help you have a better a better hatch. Um, if good news, bad news, if the salmon fly hatch is closed uh, then you'll get to hear Nick talk about the shad fishing, which is his favorite thing to do. And that'll be the next on the list. So, you know, we're basically taking that one day at a time, short goals. You know, salmon fly hatch is our first one. Um, shad fishing will be the next one. So I'm sure that down the road you'll hear a, a presentation from Nick about shad. Um, so let's get started with this. So this is my 21st or 22nd salmon fly hatch. And my first one was in 97 or 98, I can't remember exactly. Um, but I do remember the first trout that I caught on a salmon fly and the whole experience that goes with it. And those experiences just stick with you. It's such a magical moment. Um, to live through when you see that big eat and how exciting it is when they just come up out of nowhere and just explode on that on that fly and you know that's kind of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, some tactics and and thoughts that are running through my head uh, the tools of course of the trade and that kind of stuff um, so the Deschutes has a lot of different stone flies or salmon flies that hatch and they hatch throughout the year you know we start in the fall uh, or the winter time um, in the fall we have the flightless stone flies uh, throughout the winter time we have those little black stones and olives and then we have the squalas um, and then starting in May we have the goldens and the giant salmon flies, um, followed by the little yellow sallies. So really the thing that I'm going to focus on are the golden stones and the giant salmon flies. And if you haven't seen them, they're large. And giant salmon fly could be up to maybe three inches long, somewhere in that. And they're crawly. They're poor flyers, you see them in the grass, and they're just an awesome specimen to behold. And they're just such a great um, big bug in their juicy, appetizing meal for the fish. And, you know, when, and whenever I see them in the bushes, it's really exciting for me. I know it's the beginning of summer and it's my favorite time of year. And really... The salmon fly hatch is like the biggest party in Central Oregon. It's, it lasts like a month. It's basically like a festival for fly fishing. It's like basically a drug-fueled orgy. Salmon flies and stone flies are on the bushes just mating, going at it. People, like in this picture, Nick is eating them. There's just such this like crazy uh, draw and appeal to just put them in your mouth. They're so big. They are like a huge meal. Um, I have eaten them before. They're not the tastiest, but they're great. I mean, even bull trout come to this party, which don't typically eat dry flies, but they're such a big tempting meal that it draws the biggest fish out of the darkest hiding places. Um, 
the bull trout, which don't typically eat dry flies, are coming up and eating them. I mean, everyone is literally coming to this party from all over the world, from the deepest, darkest recesses of the river. It's just such a cool time of year. And, you know, the, the salmon fly or the golden stone, you know, when you see how excited trout get for them, you'll sometimes catch a fish that has eaten so many of them, he can't even get any more down in his stomach. And they're like coming out of his mouth and he's eating another one. And so it's such just a great, unique experience to see this and be part of it. You know, and what the really the the big draw is, I mean, of course, the big fish are coming out, but it's these big eats. Every fish is just jumping out of the water and aggressively smashing with reckless abandon. I mean, it is just the most active, fun fishing that we have all year. I mean, there's other great hatches, the green drakes and caddis and PMDs and PEDs and all that stuff, and they're all really good. But nothing is just crazy like this. And it is far and away my favorite time of year. If I could just live the salmon fly hatch every day, I would say that would probably be a pretty reasonable thing. Now, this little clip kind of epitomizes what the salmon fly hatch is. Beautiful, beautiful. It's eat it, this eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, upstream eat it. dry there it fly is, there it is. under the trees. Just this great takes. Maybe they miss, maybe they don't. In this little short clip here, I don't know if you guys could see it, but right, let's watch it again, right when that fly lands, the fish actually comes up and gets it, misses it, and then comes back for a second chance. So there's the miss, and there's the second take. So same fish. And this spot here on the Deschutes is between... Uh, Trout Creek and Moppin. And it's kind of in the middle. It's the beginning of my favorite day of fishing on that float. Uh, we're above the town of Dant on this big cliff wall. We're at the very top of the cliff. We haven't rounded the corner to it yet. So it's called the Golden Wall. And it's all this like commando jungle fishing, steep cliffs. And, you know, a lot of times I will float down and do like everyone does, you know, I'm hunting, I'm head hunting, I'm looking for fish rising, but I'm not necessarily only casting to rising fish. If I were only casting to rising fish, there would be days where I would just push out because they're not rising. So a lot of times I'm making them rise. This is from last year. Um, last year I spent quite a few days fishing the salmon fly hatch. Uh, I think I was down there 18 days of, let's say, a 22, 20, 22-day hatch. So I did a pretty good amount of time guiding and private fishing. And I just did basically uh, Trout Creek down to Maupin, multi-day, uh, two-night, three-day trips back to back to back uh, the, whole, the whole time. Just fishing and filtering through and fil fishing and catching a lot of fish. I would say for us it wouldn't be unreasonable. Uh, to raise, you know, in the best days, maybe the eight best days of fishing we had, about a hundred fish per person per day. So pretty good numbers, um, you know, so it's definitely my favorite thing to do. Of course, that's not a catch rate. That's just how many eats we could, we could get trout to come up and eat the fly. Um, some days you have a real high success rate where you're probably landing, you know, 50, 60. And uh, some days, yeah, maybe more than 50 or 60, maybe it's 60, 70, and then just an average catch rate of maybe 50, you know, so kind of 50%. So if you haven't experienced this hatch, um, it's definitely mind-boggling or mind-blowing. Um, you're out there and there's just these huge bugs that are crawling all over you. They're in your shirt collar and they're climbing up the up your you know your shirt sleeve and the cuff of your pants and you know if you don't like crawly things on you if that bothers you this might not be the hatch for you 
Um, and at the end of your trip, when you get home, they're everywhere. They're in your tackle bag. They're in your truck. They're, I mean, it's just, these things are everywhere. And it is a very fun um, hatch to, to be a part of. And it's, you know, it's just one of those things, though. But if you can't handle the, um, if you can't handle the bugs crawling on you, my suggestion is don't go because it is the worst. <clears throat> so this is the time of year where the salmon flies, the nymphs, actually start their migration. And so mid-April, maybe late April, they start their migration. They start crawling for the shore. They're staging up to crawl out into the bushes and hatch. Uh, these giant salmon flies can live in the river for up to three years, maturing into the that adult stage. And these giant aquatic insects are crawlers, and they're very clumsy swimmers. So they're not swimming around very much. Most of the time they have some kind of behavioral drift uh, downstream as they're moving into place, and then they crawl out. And, you know, when this is happening, nymphing, is can just be insane and you don't necessarily need to have a heavy nymph to do it to do well because a lot of times you're fishing in more shallow water that's right along the bank and this is definitely a situation where a uh, euro nymphing or check nymphing is just rules the roost because you're fishing in close and you're fishing relatively shallow um, and this is a really good time and so it's a nice transition now, when the time is right, these nymphs are going to crawl out of the river to hatch. And it's going to be a thing um, where it happens in the early evening through the night. And I guarantee that you've seen these shucks and husks from where they've hatched out on fence posts and signs and in the bushes and on trees. And basically what happens is they're going to crawl out of the, the river. They're going to crawl to some high stable ground that they can hold on to. And they're going to start to dry out and they're going to crack this exoskeleton. And then they're going to wiggle right out of it. And so this is kind of a, the, you know, this process takes a long time. If you were to watch it happen, you'd be there all day. Uh, if I were to video it for you, we would spend a lot of time like sleeping instead of watching this and getting through this presentation. But this is kind of the tail end of one wiggling out. And you can kind of see it just is twisting and grabbing. And all of a sudden it kind of turns and breaks free of it. And now it's kind of going to let the blood flow to its wings and it's going to dry out and its wings are going to uncurl. And so this process, even though it's out of the husk, is still going to take some time for it to finish to become an adult and to get to the point where it can um, mate and fly and, and lay eggs and that kind of stuff. So I don't want to call this necessarily the salmon fly stats, but it's kind of when people tell you about the salmon fly hatch and this is what you do, this is basically what people tell you. And I remember, like I said, 20 some odd years ago, my first salmon fly hatch, and this is what people told me. And it uh, was kind of what I lived and died by, and it's still what a lot of people believe. And so essentially, the salmon fly hatch would start in mid May around the Moppin area and go uh, works its way upstream moving about a mile a day or two miles a day and it goes through July 1st and where I fish is mostly the Mecca area at that time now I fish a lot from Mecca or Warm Springs all the way down to um, Moppin, Harpen Flats typically um, and so at the Mecca area the true, like, day one, you could set your clock by it, would be Memorial Day weekend. And so every year on Memorial Day weekend, we would go to Mecca, and that would be, like, the first day 
of the salmon fly hatch, whatever day it was. So typically for us it would be Monday, but the week you would watch the fishing ramp up. Um, but it would just get better and better and it would be happening. And then we would know we would basically have till July 1st. And there's still a lot of guys that hold on to that um, idea. Um, you know, the other things that everyone's talking about is that you would just fit, all you needed to do was fish right next to the bank. You just fish under the grass and you're going to get them. And all you need is a seven and a half foot 3X leader. And the only fly you need is a chubby Chernobyl. And you'd use a dry dropper if they're not eating. You know, and in my mind, that's not really it. I, I basically throw all that out the window in my mind. Salmon fly hatch happens at a different time. The fish start off early right next to the bank, but after they've felt some fishing pressure, they move deep. Seven and a half foot leader is a great leader if you're just trying to cast really short distances and get short drifts. Chubby Chernobyl is a good fly that works really good, but if you, like every other angler, fish it, a lot of fish see it. And, you know, I just am not really down with the dry dropper. That's just not my thing. So as we go through um, this presentation, I'm going to talk about why I feel like those things aren't right and uh, how we can change them and, and why. And how you can be more successful and start catching fish. Not that you aren't catching fish, but how you can just maybe do a better job of it. So really, when you start talking about this, you need to kind of talk about the when. And like I said, historically, uh, Memorial Day through the 4th of July is the biggest time the hatch moves upriver. Well, once this mixing tower got put into place and was activated, the, the fishing really changed. And it was very noticeable when that happened. At that time, I was working at the Welch's Fly Shop, uh, 2011, I think. And I remember we had just finished the spay clave. So it was like, you know, maybe the 16th or 17th, something like that. Spay clave was on a, you know, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we had just finished up, um, broke everything down, and I was been working, you know, every single day trying to make this thing happen. And got done and was like, okay, well, I'm going to go fishing. I hooked up the drift boat, grabbed my girlfriend on Monday morning, drove out to, to Warm Springs, to the Warm Springs boat ramp on the Deschutes, got there and was literally the only boat in the in the boat launch. And at that time of year, guys, a lot of people weren't fishing it early. I mean, we would do week trips on opening weekend, which was just two weeks before, and do Trout Creek Down and be the only boat in that 30-mile stretch of river. So I, it was maybe less populated. I mean, there was st are still were still a lot of people fishing it at that time, but it just wasn't as busy, if that makes sense. So got to the boat launch, pulled on my waders, back to the, the boat into the ramp, and just kind of glanced in the bushes and was like, oh my god, there are salmon flies everywhere. What is going on? And it was, you know, two weeks before it should have happened. And there is literally not another boat in the boat launch. I pushed the, the boat into the water you know, I hadn't really planned on this being a thing or happening. And just because I had my tackle bag with me, uh, by luck, at that stage of that time of my life and of guiding, I would was basically packing everything, including the kitchen sink with me. So I happened to have salmon fly dries. And I just remember, like, pushing away from the bank, like, I've never seen anything like this this could be the best day of fishing ever. And we floated down, you know, a quarter of a mile or whatever uh, to the two islands uh, above the Morrison property, pulled over, fished the riffle, and it was just like we got like five fish. And it was just like, oh my God, it's on. And all on dry flies. And 
at that point, another boat kind of floats by, and I can see it, and I'm like, oh, it's Eric Newfeld, And he's with another fly shop, uh, one of the Ben fly shops, and I'm like, dude, this is insane. The salmon fly hatch is on. And they're like, what? And it was literally just the the five of us out there fishing. And because there was no one, we're fishing everything. And we're within, you know, 50 yards of each other basically the whole day. And you could just hear each boat just hooting and hollering with, like, glee because we have, like, lucked into this private salmon fly hatch fishery that no one else is, is doing or was even aware of. So if you're still living by the that memory that the salmon fly hatch is basically Memorial Day till the 4th of July, you will miss the salmon fly hatch. The salmon fly hatch now basically lasts for two weeks and goes from basically, let's say, May 10th, 11th on a long year. You know, maybe it goes to... To June 4th or 5th, which is basically what happened last year. It had, had a rainy start to it, and so that kind of helps retard it and keep it moving at a slow pace. Uh, it still moves fast, and um, when it's over, it's over. And so um, as you are out there thinking about it, your timing needs to be perfect. When you if you hearken back to those old days that it used to be Memorial Day till the 4th of July, you're going to miss the boat. So throw that out the window and put on your calendar, you know, May 10th, 11th, 12th, whatever, pick a day and go till, you know, June 1. And if you're any days on either end of that, it's going to be slim pickings out there. And the other thing is, of course, if you wait till you hear a fishing report, it's probably going to be just about to the end of it. So I would say, uh, of course, like I normally do, is just get out there and make your own uh, fishing report. So kind of the next thing, um, where you fish. Like I said, I have a tendency uh, to float. Um, typically, I fish from the Warm Springs boat launch, where 26 crosses the Deschutes down to the town of Maupin. So that's basically, you know, it's not 50 miles, but let's call it that 50 miles of river. And that's where I spend all of my time, 20 some odd years fishing that. And so when I talk about the salmon fly hatch, it's definitely pertaining to that. So it's a very, it's an isolated piece of water. It's 50 miles, so it's not that isolated. There's roads all over the place, but it's some of this will be applicable to other rivers, uh, but this is specific to that stretch of the Deschutes. And so that's part of the where. Um, of course, you know, when I'm thinking about where, you know, I'm not just thinking, um, you know, the what piece of water to fish, you know, as opposed to like, am I going to cast under the trees? Am I going to fish next to the to the bushes? Am I going to fish deep? So, you know, uh, the where is two wares in there for me. Like I said, it's that float section. So part of that float section is, you know, when I start out, you know, I have to be aware that there's all these different water types. And even just as I float down from Warm Springs, the river is dammed. It's 100 miles long, so it is a tailwater. But when you get down lower, it seems to be more of a freestone river, is, you know, what I've always felt like or believed. Um, so when you, when you go from the dam, if you just break the river down into sections and you go from the dam down, the first couple miles doesn't have any tributaries that flow into it. So that river stretch has not really changed. Uh, because there's no bed load shift of gravel um, coming out of those creeks that affect spawning gravel and pushes it down river. Not to mention the river fluctuates, but it doesn't rarely, it rarely fluctuates with these big high water events like we have on the Sandy and the Clackamas and the coast. So, 
You know, every, once every couple of years we get a big high water event. We'll have higher than average, but it won't affect, uh, it won't make big changes too much. So you have this first stretch that's from uh, the dam down to Shittai Creek. And so that's literally one stretch. And so Shittai Creek comes in uh, basically where 26 crosses um, the Deschutes. And then you basically have this first stretch that is this low gradient stretch of river that cuts through the plains. And if you look when you're in this stretch, it's not mountainous, it's more of these plateaus and short hills. And so that stretch runs from Shittai Creek down to where the Deschutes pushes into the Mutton Mountains. And that is the most classic water type fishing that there is. It's low rolling hills, uh, low gradient. There are some steep banks, but most of that stuff you can get into. There's the railroad grade, of course, where they blasted the railroad and it drops in. And then once you hit the Mutton Mountains, that's where the river changes again. And the river becomes much steeper. And it's cutting through the mountains. That's where White Horse Rapids is. And all these other rapids, Buckskin Mary. And as you get into the town of Mop, and it continues on with the steep gradient through um, Wapanisha and um, Boxcar and uh, Oak Springs and so and then leading up into Shears Falls and so you have all these big rapids in this steeper stretch of river and when you get into the steeper stretch of river you have this more you know cut banks where you get can't even barely get into the water because it's so steep and there's less of these big shelves around and these big flat plains uh, or benches rolling into the river so you have a, all this varied fishing terrain as you're pushing down the river. And then, of course, from Shears Falls down, you have the next stretch of river, which is going to be uh, this, the lower 30 miles, essentially, where it has a little bit lower gradient, and it becomes kind of the, the delta where it enters the Columbia. And so that's kind of the different river types that you have. And then the where, of course, is uh, where you're going to fish, the, the commando fishing in the jungle water, the hardest to fish places. You know, you want to essentially go where no man has gone before. So if it's hard to fish, it's going to be a more likely spot that an, another angler hasn't been in there and hasn't fished over it and disturbed those fish. So if you're losing a lot of flies, you're in the right water. The other thing that a lot of people leave out and that they don't fish is the more open water. And the open water is one of the things that I find I have a lot more success in, especially if I'm able to cast far. Um, you can see in this picture of Ian, you know, he's at this top of this riffle where it breaks wide. You know, most people think that they're gonna fish under that alder right at the top of the riffle and they're going to fish that opening but what happens is you know that island salmon flies are flying off that island and landing in the water and floating through that heavy rapid out there and trout are staged up way out in that riffle waiting for the ones that couldn't take off and they're eating them in that riffle as far out as possible so a place that doesn't get touched is a place that is the hardest or furthest to cast to. And so a lot of times we find great success more in the open water than under the, the trees or right off those grass banks because that's where everyone can cast to and where everyone is typically thinking about fishing. So a lot of times I'm trying to think about changing up my uh, places and presentations. A lot of times I'm trying to fish on those big gravel bars uh, if there is a slight chance that I can stop on a gravel bar, uh, sadly, I'm, I might say that I'm uh, stupid or reckless or both. A lot of times I'll pull off on a gravel bar that's, you know, two feet deep where when I bail out of the boat, I have to hold the boat. Otherwise, it's going to, to float away and get whoever's in the front of the boat enough courage to jump out in the current 
and fish, but it's these untouched places that people find great success, um, not the place that everyone is fishing over and over and over again. So trying to, trying to put a little different spin on it, if it's hard to wade, if it's deep, um, you're probably going to be more successful. If it's a steep bank where the currents are really conflicting, um, you're going to do a, a, a great present. You're going to have a good uh, fish presentation or fly presentation to those fish because they're untouched. Um, so that's kind of what I think about. Um, and this is one of those kind of spots right here. You know, it's, I, I'm, I'm standing in the bow of the drift boat over this guy. Um, you know, you can see that big grass clump is just a poison oak, you know, death machine. Don't touch it. Um, he's fishing down around this rapid, and that fish that he's hooked up to didn't come from above him or out in front of him. It came from down below that alder, which we were downstream feeding to. So when I'm thinking about my presentations, I'm trying to think, of any way that I can get a fly to anywhere a fish might live out there. Not just that classic upstream dry fly. You know, I'm casting up and out and I'm casting straight down and, you know, I'm feeding it under trees and into places where even if I get it in, if I get it in there luckily one time, you know, I might have broken off five flies trying to get it in there um, because it's such a tight place to get into. But once you get it down in there, you know, you're, the reward is going to be well worth that risk. Um, so that's kind of the stuff that I'm looking for. But, of course, I, I, uh, when I start in, I'm going to do everything like normal. I'm going to do my close-in perimeter where I'm basically just dapping the fly almost just in really close before I even step in the water. Because a lot of times there are fish just right where you're going to get in. They are staged up close to the edge, no matter what I what I say. Um, they are always right on the edge in the beginning of this until they've been overfished and pushed out. Um, so I'm going to do that perimeter and then my classic upstream, and I'm going to go, of course, change it and cast up and out. And I I would bet that I catch 50 to 60 percent of my fish on my up and out cast, where I'm getting as long of a drift as possible, uh, where a lot of times by the end of the drift, I'm feeding my backing out there. Um, and so I'm trying to get a hundred foot long drift or whatever it is. And so it's, it's the guy that I used to fish with, Doug Cook, um, has a lot of different names. Uh, ultimate like white trash dude. Um, he looks like, uh, if you ever see him, he looks like he could be on ZZ Top. Um, or like out of straight out of deliverance. Uh, some guys refer to him as deliverance, Doug, uh, but a mentor and his thing was he was really good at fishing where no one else could. And by doing that, it was casting as far as possible and getting as long of a drift as possible. And so I've really taken that into the fishing that I do, uh, especially for trout, especially with the, the big salmon flies. So, you know, my, based on that, my tactics are a little bit different. That three and a half foot or that seven and a half foot leader doesn't work for that. And so um, I changed those things up a little bit. Um, and this is that down and out um, downstream feed. You know, this, this guy took uh, right below that big rock. And, you know, if you had just been casting up to that grass clump up above him, you know, you would have got a fish, but you wouldn't have gotten this fish. So being able to fish everything everywhere is, is definitely important um, and not just focusing on that classic what's right above you uh, kind of stuff. Um, so like I said before, um, I'm just reading this uh, question from Scott Russell. Uh, so we'll come. So Scott says, uh, sometimes the fish will come and flash tail slap my fly repeatedly but won't bite uh any thoughts on changing presentation to get a take uh you know what that is a great question i have a lot of thoughts about that uh good news bad news i haven't actually had uh so this is a little tongue-in-cheek i actually haven't had a conversation with the fish so i don't know exactly what the deal is um but when 
I think about that. I see it a lot. I think it's probably one of two things. Um, one thing I think is that when you see them come in flash and slash and flash under it and, and look at it, a lot of times they might be about to take it and then the fly starts to drag. And then so they've rejected it. And I think that happens quite a bit. The other thing that I think happens um, is that a lot of guys make their cast and presentation and the fish attacks it and the fish is trying to drown the fly and they take it under first and then they come back around and then attack it and actually eat it. So a lot of times when those flashy, when they roll on it and they smack it, they're trying to take it down. Um, so there's two different things really. Uh, so they're trying to take it down, drown it, make sure that maybe they've been tempted by too many anglers and they know that it's, they are questioning if it's fake or real. So they take it down to make sure that it doesn't get pulled away from them by the angler. Um, or it's uh, the fly comes under drag too fast and they're, so I think if you see a flash underneath, your fly has come under tension and it's dragging. I think if the fly roll, if the fish rolls on the fly, uh, he is thinking about taking it uh, and he's trying to drown it and hasn't committed to it yet. Uh, so that would be my, my two thoughts on that. Uh, so a longer leader would be probably the best thing. Um, I never change up flies and I'll get back into that in a second um, or in a few minutes from here. Um, I ch don't change up my fly, but I do uh, fish a really long leader, and I think that is uh, the biggest secret uh, to my fishing, probably. And I'll talk about that stuff here in a minute, too. Um, Colby asks, uh, if I have added two-handers to the mix for reaching tough areas that require long casts. Uh, yeah, I absolutely have added uh, trout spay uh, into my lineup um, when I get into the a little bit deeper into this i don't talk specifically about it but there's a number of spots where i am fishing a trout spay i put a scandy type shooting head on it and a long leader um, to get a greater distance the bad news with that type of setup is that you make the cast out there and you can't mend it so you basically get two, I'm using it for a distance, so I'm trying to get out. And so you get two presentations. You get an up and across, and it fishes till about 90 degrees straight out. So you cast it up at a 45, and it fishes to 90 degrees. And what happens is once it hits 90 degrees, it starts to belly down river and starts to drag too much. And because it's a short head, as soon as you try to mend it when it hits 90 degrees, you know, you have a short running line and a thick scandy type head. Um, it drags it too much and it pulls it out of position and it won't really let it pop up again. Um, and then, so then my next presentation is basically I cast with the, the Scandi setup straight out and at 90 degrees. And when I make that, or just down, and when I make that cast, I do a reach mend up river um, so that it will add slack into it. So I can just do a downstream presentation. And those are definitely the two uh, tools that I use that for. But for being able to reach into the 70, 80 foot range, especially where you have a steep bank behind you that's a riprap, uh, that no one, that you cannot throw a back cast or a steeple cast into because it, your cast won't go the 80 feet or however far you need it to go. Um, it's the absolute ultimate tool. I fish mostly a nine foot five weight with a Rio Gold that has a 45 foot head and I can spay cast that uh, maybe around 65, 70 feet. So I can shoot a lot of line, um, but because it has a long head in a tighter situation, 
it's harder to cast when I'm right up against the bank. And so that's really why I switched to doing that. <clears throat> but with my whole casting game, you know, I'm, I'm bringing my A game. I'm bringing my whole arsenal. I'm doing everything I can uh, to make presentations to fish. So, you know, there's places where I'm standing in between two trees in a pile of alders where there's no possible way I can make a cast. So I'm just going to do a bow and arrow cast, which is basically, you know, you hold just the leader and the fly off the tip of your rod and pull it, pull it back and launch it. And that is um, a cast that you don't find um, employed very much in regular trout fishing. Not with the caddis fly hatch, not so much with mayfly hatches, but with this, it's definitely something that I use quite a bit. Roll cast, yeah, I'm using the roll cast like as much as possible. Um, in my classic, you know, upstream dry fly presentation where I'm casting straight up and stripping it back down to me, half the time I'm just roll casting it right back up as opposed to picking it up and false casting it five times to get it to shoot out there. Uh, roll cast and like this picture, you know, is essentially a spay cast. Um, you know, the snake roll and all that kind of stuff, I'm definitely using that. The curve cast, if you guys don't know what that is, uh, learn it because it is the number one thing you can do, which allows you on your upstream presentation to basically cast around a corner and put your fly under the trees uh, without your fly line lining the fish and landing on top of them. And so when you work on this cast where you have a, essentially you're making an upriver cast and you make a really hard stop and it turns your fly line, a night, you're the tip of your fly line 90, 90 degrees under the trees, um, you're winning because you're getting into a space where you couldn't make a cast to before. Uh, so that's a really, a really good thing to do uh, to figure out what to do. Uh, puddle cast. I do a downstream feed all the time. Uh, like I said before, I'm trying to send it under, you know, under a tree opening that's, you know, eight, 10 inches tall, and I can never cast under it. So if I make a puddle cast and throw a bunch of slack into it and then feed it down under there, um, you know, again, it's another tool and technique that I use that other people aren't doing. Uh, that is a, a really good tool that I really use during this situation. The other time I use that puddle cast and downstream feed is really in the uh, green dray catch. That's the other prominent one where I use that. <clears throat> when you're doing that, uh, a lot of these, like this picture here of that up and out cast, uh, aerial mend reach cast, where you're throwing a bunch of slack in the line um, without having to try to stack mend it out there and move your fly uh, is a really good tool. So trying to come up with every casting technique that you can think of uh, will really be advantageous for you when you're doing this. And so, um, you know, classic upstream, um, here's that bow and arrow. You know, the bow and arrow is great if you don't have a back cast because you just basically uh, hold on to it and you just flip it right where you want it to go. You're not looking for a long presentation. You're looking for that fly to get into, you know, the bucket and you're fishing it for a foot or two feet. And that's all you need. And then you're stripping it back in and, and kind of wiggling it out and just doing that over and over again. And so, like I said, just having this uh, stuff in your arsenal is just a huge uh, thing. So tackle, I, uh, Nick laughs at me quite a bit when we talk about this. Uh, I'm typically in a drift boat or raft or whatever when I do this. Um, and I take like, you know, five rods, um, all of them rigged up with the same exact fly, uh, just different leader length. And I'm always using a weight forward. I'm like a creature of habit. I fish basically, um, the same real gold on every rod. It casts really good. 
Um, I use a five or a six weight, six weight when I need to throw, you know, really far or beat the wind. Otherwise, I just use a, a, the normal five weight. Um, and I use a lot of floating. And so I'll, during that, you know, three weeks of salmon fly hatch, I'll go through two or three things of floating because I'm using so much floating. It's, I'm probably addicted. It's, it's like crack. You got to just keep putting more on and keep that fly floating. Um, but, you know, what happens is you get into that rhythm and technique and you figure out what works the best for you and, and you just keep making it happen. This is the part that I think that everyone's been doing the same thing since the beginning of time. That I think if you can change it up a little bit, um, you'll be a lot more successful. If you go into any fly shop and ask any person behind the counter, what leader should I get for the salmon fly hatch? I, I will put 10 to one odds on it. The, the first thing out of their mouth will be seven and a half foot three X. That's what you get. It turns over the fly really easy. Yeah, well, it does turn over the fly really easy. But the reason they make long leaders is so you can get long drifts. And so, when you have a seven and a half foot leader and all you're fishing is like a five foot long drift, that's perfect. But when you're trying to get a drag free presentation in really turbid water that has just different currents flowing everywhere, the longer your leader and tippet material, the longer it's going to take for that leader to come under tension and suck your fly down. And Really, the name of the game here is having the longest drag-free drift possible so the fish has the maximum amount of time to see your fly actually floating before it gets, uh, comes under tension and starts to drag or gets sunk. So I would say that 110% of the time, I fish a leader that's... 11 to 13 feet long for the salmon fly hatch. And I can tell you that the amount of times that I use a seven and a half foot leader, even though I put for under the trees here, I wanted to humor guys that were, that were like, you have to use a seven and a half foot leader, that's what it is. I just put that in there to humor people. I use a seven and a half foot leader absolutely zero times in a year. Absolutely zero, not once. I The problem is, my cast turns over really good. It turns over too good. The thing lands absolutely tight as just, you know, it's completely tight under tension like a guitar string and immediately the thing starts to drag. And I can see it out there and I watch fish turn off of it immediately. When I go to this really long leader, typically what I do is I buy a 12 foot long 3X leader. I cut four feet of it off right out of the gate. So I'm starting to get back into the thicker diameter. And then I just tie 3X tip it on. So I'm already, I have a powerful turnover and I have a lot of tippet. So the butt section casts and lands straight and the tippet section lands all squiggly. So it's gonna have time to expand and pull away without dragging immediately. And I guarantee just changing that one thing will up your success rate by, 40% probably. I mean, I, I don't have any uh, empirical data to back that up, but I would say that would be a pretty reasonable uh, number to think about. 12 foot leader is a little bit harder to cast. So you do have a balancing point. Um, so maybe you start with a nine foot leader cut off two feet. So it's seven feet. I know this sounds weird that you would just butcher your leader like this, but what you're trying to do is if I just tied on one foot of tippet on my nine foot leader and made it 10 feet, I'm gonna have a knot at the one foot section, right? And so what I wanna do is put that knot further back. And so I'm gonna cut two, my two feet of tippet off, blood knot or triple surgeon my tippet on and put three feet on. So now I've gone from nine down to seven, back to 10 or 11, right? And so that would be a good jump off point. But using the longer leader is gonna be I guarantee a, a very good key um, for being more successful. 
yeah, Eric Killerns, long leader. It's where it's at, right? Yeah, I am with you, man. Like everyone with the short leader, yeah, it's easy to cast and turn the big bug over, but that's literally all it does for you. Um, so if you want to have the best, longest drag-free drift, long leader will get it done. You'll be amazed by how much longer of a drift you can get. Like I said, you know, a lot of times I'm fishing that um, up and across and I'm feeding out, backing out of the tip of my rod. And if I were fishing a seven and a half foot leader, I would not be able to do that because it would have already drug and pulled tight at that point. So uh, I'll get off my off my uh, soapbox here and move on. But uh, leader and tippet, I never use anything less than 3x uh, for the salmon fly hatch. There's no point. I was uh, guiding with Rob Crandall this last year during salmon fly hatch, and uh, this kid came out who fished on the uh, uh, Delaware and. He was like, I don't know why you guys are using 3X. These aren't 3X fish. I'm like, well, they might not be 3X fish, but this is a 3X hatch. And, you know, we, I put him in this spot where we're standing at the top of a rapid. And he's like, we should be fishing 5X. I'm like, no, just hold, hold on, Turbo. And um, so we cast up. The fish eats the fly. We're literally standing at the top of a rapid. And the fish just blows by him and is just somersaulting through the rapid and is immediately into his backing. And I'm like, and that's why we use 3X. And he just yarded the fish right back up through the rapid. You know, 3X enables us to throw our flies into the trees and to yank them out and still get them back. And so, yeah, the fish aren't like, we're not catching 10 pound fish. I get it, I know that. But it's all the other parts of 3X or why we're gonna use it. So. You don't need 4X. Yeah, maybe they're spooky, but they're they're not. I mean, 3X is the perfect material for this, no question. Um, and you get you can put a lot more pressure on them. You can land them in the heavy, fast water. Uh, this again is another picture of that open water fishing where you get uh, where you get to actually get them in the wide open, cast far, land them kind of thing, and it's where it's at. Uh, here is, if you have ever listened to any of my other presentations, um, there's always some great debate, right? Steelheading, it's set the hook or don't set the hook. Hold a shock loop or don't hold a shock loop. Um, so this is uh, that question. Everyone is always like, dry dropper, run a dry dropper. And, uh, you know, my answer to that is no, don't do that. Um, I'm not down with the dry dropper for the salmon fly hatch. Um, well, maybe I am, but the thing is, when you're fishing under these trees and you're casting a dry dropper under there, the dropper flies wildly off the end of the off the end of the dry fly. And what happens is your dry fly landed where you wanted it to land and the dropper landed in the tree. And so now the dropper is attached to the tree and your fly isn't going anywhere, right? Because it just put on the brakes. So you break it off, you tie it back on and you do that and then you do it again. And then five times later, you're like, yeah, the dry, the dry dropper probably not good for this. Um, so in the heart of the salmon fly hatch, when you're like commando fishing and you're up under the trees and you're getting wild, don't bother with the dropper. It actually will make you catch less fish. I know that sounds crazy, but you'll spend a lot more time rigging, re-rigging, and in the trees uh, trying to pull it out than you will uh, trying to just feed the fish your fly. So, I mean, do whatever you want. And in my world, if I'm fishing behind you, the best thing you can do is fish a dry dropper because you're gonna spend less time actually fishing. Um, and so I'll be able to come in behind you and clean up a little bit more. Um, same with steelheading in this world. Um, run and gun. You don't need a pack. You don't need a ton of crap. What you need is your nippers, tippet, flies, and floating. Um, a net maybe is a good idea too. But streamline your approach. 
that when you bail out of the boat or you climb under the trees or bushes, you don't have a lot of stuff to get hung up on. You don't have a lot of choices out there. Um, minimize, and this is always one of those things that I talked about, minimizing your choice overload. You don't want to have to think too hard about what to use. I'm not going to bring 20 different leaders, uh, 3X, 4X, 5X, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 feet long. I just, I literally bring like two things. I'm going to bring, I do bring two liters, a nine foot and a 12 foot, and I bring 3X tippet. And maybe I bring some butt section or a backup of whatever, but minimizing that choice where I don't have a lot of choices. You can see in that picture, there's only one fly in my waiter pocket. And I use one fly. There are a lot of flies out there. But this is basically when I get to tying flies and I get to that zone. Speaking of stats, I'm going to tie this fly. I guarantee that I will tie 100 of them for this salmon fly hatch. And at the end, I will only have like two left. And the reason I do that is I have this one, and I'll talk about it in a second, but I have a fly that I have confidence in. I can tie it. I'm not afraid to lose it. Um, this is the standby right here. Everyone knows it, loves it, fishes it, works great. Yeah, and it works probably just pretty good because literally everyone is fishing it. And so it floats really good. It has that going for it. It's easy to see. But literally, I guarantee, you know, if there's 60 people logged in watching this, if 60 of you have fished the salmon fly hatch, 58 of you have this fly. I guarantee it. And so if you have a change up fly that's not the same thing that everyone's using, there's a strong possibility that you will be rewarded. Um, again, there's no empirical data. I can't prove that. Um, but I would say I suspect that you're going to be better. Now, that's not to say the chubby Chernobyl is not proven because the thing works great. But maybe there's a time and place to use something a little bit different. Most of everyone knows these flies. They're just a classic Clark Stone, which is just a great low riding. Um, you know, the... Um, uh, gosh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Kenny Morris's stone and the one on the bottom is that classic like rogue stone and um, stimulator. I mean, these are all just like great flies and just a very good, I like to fish a really uh, big in the sense of long, uh, but very, I fish a low profile fly. Uh, foam of course is awesome because it floats really, really good. Uh, typically rides low, you know, I like the realistic looking fly. Uh, Normwood special, that's like my go-to fly, sort of. Um, I used to fish, like I said, with that dude, uh, Deliverance Doug, and um, he fished with this guy named Gary Hilton, who was good friends with Norm Woods, and he fished like a hybrid version, and honestly, this fly that we see on the screen that every fly manufacturer sells commercially as a Normwood Special looks absolutely nothing like a Normwood Special. That fly on the left is actually a Normwood Special. And you can see that it is like a ratty looking thing. Um, typically Norm would trim the wing by hand to even up the tips. And it just had a little bit of a tail. It was like the craziest, ugliest, shabbiest pattern ever but it worked really good. So um, Gary got flies from Norm, gave them to Doug. Doug tied his own version, which looks similar to that one on the right, which we called the Hilti Special. And everyone, as they tie a fly, you know, they change it to do what they want. Well, that is my version on the right, and it's called the Miffer. And it has been changed substantially. You can see it's, it's this alternate version, uh, but mine is a foam body and I tie it with a lot of hackle so it floats. I tie it in such a way that it rides really low 
I put a ton of floating on it. I put two different kinds of floating on it, actually. I put mucilin in the wing, so that mucilin is really thick and makes that wing clump up and lay down. Uh, mucilin's hard to get now, so I use the balloon paste now, which is like a paraffin-based kind of wax. So it gets in there and it clumps up and it makes it lay down. Once I do that, then I coat the rest of it with some kind of like gink or uh, aquel or something like that. So it really floats. And I'm using this fly. I don't put any rib on it. It's literally like four materials and it's not a strong fly. I'll tie a hundred of them because I'm gonna throw it in the trees and I'm not gonna try to get it back. I am going to break it out. I'm gonna break it off. It's gonna just be ripped out of the tree. I'm gonna land five fish on it and the hackle is gonna be broken off. I'm gonna cut it off and I'm just gonna throw it in the throw it in the garbage and call it good. But because I have supreme confidence in this fly, I literally only carry one fly. And I'll, like I said, I don't do the chubby Chernobyl or any of that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's just like with when I'm preaching about steelhead fishing, minimizing that choice overload. When I, I, I maybe have more choice overload actually because I tie a hundred of these and now I have a bag full of a hundred and I'm like, I have my nose in the bag, like what's the best one? And now I have to like sort through them to find what I think is the best one, but it doesn't matter. They're all the best if they're in that bag. Um, but it's not like I'm opening a big fly box that has 20 chubby Chernobyls and they're purple and red and black and orange and um, whatever color. And then I have stimulators and, you know, sofa pillows and Kenny Moore specials and on and on and on. I mean, no offense, Joel, please come buy all those flies from us because we need to sell some and they're great. Um, but, you know, I just need in my world to minimize that impact where I don't have to think about it. And so um, Adam asked if there's a fly tying video coming for that soon. Uh, Nick and I were just talking about that this morning. I'm a little torn. Uh, it is absolutely like my secret deadly fly. I show people it all the time and I give away probably. Uh, I say I tie 100 for myself for fishing. I probably tie 150 and I give 50 away and I keep 100 for fishing. Um, but Nick and I were talking about putting together a kit with directions and a video for that and trying to do it uh, this week or next week. So yeah, Adam, hopefully we will have that coming up pretty quick. Um, so yeah, that's my, uh, my fly choice. Like I said, I have one and I feel like it's uh, the best. It works for me. It's proven. And if you, if you really look at basically every uh, picture in this slideshow that we've looked at, I would bet that 90% of them are on this uh, fly. And when you see it in the water, um, you know, I trim the hackle off the bottom um, so it lays flat and sits flush in the water. It rides really low. The, the wing is laying down in a clump over the top. I mean, this is like the realest, uh, most real looking salmon fly that you've seen out there. And it's easy to lose it in and amongst a crowd of them. Um, and so uh, Todd Davidson asked, what size am I tying the Mifrin? I mostly tie it in the biggest 200R they make, uh, so a size four. And so the fly in the end is uh, maybe uh, two and a half or almost three inches long. Um, but it's like, it's in every picture in here uh, because it is just, it works that good. Um, And I think that is, we're kind of winding down here. Um, do you guys have more questions about any of that stuff I was talking about? Feel free to unmute your, uh, your microphone if you have any questions for Josh. You know, the, so the last part, of course, um, Annette's probably a good idea, um, but this is maybe the funnest part of the whole, uh, part of fishing is after you've landed them letting them go and having that like moment of sin with the fish I would say that's definitely a big part of it for me
Hey, Josh, would you mind just sharing the materials list for that slide? Uh, sure. Um, so I'll, and I can post it online for everyone. Um, but the, sh the long and short of it is I use a Timco 200R. I use orange two millimeter foam. I use uh, Metz Ginger Saddle Hackle number two. I use a uh, 10 calf tail. I use fluorescent flame thread or red. And I use a uh, brown uh, hackle, uh, just a standard brown uh, Metz number two um, tying cape. <laughs> hey, Josh. Yeah. Um, do you ever nymph fish during the salmon fly hatch? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> um, that's a good, that's a really good question. There's, and Nick has lived this with me a number of times. And so, um, I feel so long, I, if you guys have a minute, I have a long story. <clears throat> I feel like Nick had lived a sheltered life before I entered his world. <laughs> and I started to take him under my wing and force him to do the things the way I wanted as opposed to the way he had historically done them or not done them or however he was doing things. So I took him on my first salmon fly trip with him and we get to the boat launch and we're rigging up rods and I, and I pull out like three rods and I string them all up and I just put the same dry fly on three different rods. <laughs> <laughs> he rigs up, you know, a nymphing rod and a dry fly rod and this and whatever he rigs up. And he's like, well, what are you going to do if the dry fly doesn't work? I'm like, <laughs> Of course, the dry fly is going to work, you know. <laughs> the only reason it's not going to work is if I don't use it, right? And so when he got on the river, you know, he was looking. Or we pull into the first spot, and I hop out, and we bang like five fish on dries. All the boats that are floating by, you can see they all have bobbers yeah. rigged up, right? Yeah. So yeah. Nymph yeah. fishing. And people were like, how's it going? And, you know, I know everyone in that stretch. And so how's it going? Are you guys getting any? And I'm, like, torn to tell them, like, yeah, we're railing on them on dries. Mm -hmm. But if I tell them that, are they going to switch to doing what we're doing? And so at the end of the day, I talked to, like, <laughs> five of them, and they're like, man, nymphing was terrible. I'm like, I bet it was. I bet it was. Mm -hmm. um, so... When it's the heart of the season, I literally uh -huh. bring three to five rods, but they'll all be rigged up with the same exact dry fly. And the reason is, uh, so when I break it off, I can just switch to a different rod. Wow. Yeah. So I, during the salmon fly hatch, I guarantee you from uh, May 10th to July, or May 10th to June 7th, I mm -hmm. will not rig up a nymph rod. Yeah. Wow. So... Uh, but that's, you know. That's you, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's I have you. that um, uh, ultimate confidence that the dry yeah. fly will prevail yeah. at that point. Yeah. yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question. Go ahead. Before the mixing station was um, put in place, and you talked about how... Um, the hatch was a lot longer, basically from May 15th till July 1st, about then. Um, was it as good as it is now? Oh, like, yeah. Through that whole set, through that whole stretch, oh, yeah. or was it uh, oh, yeah. better? It was hey, better. I don't, who, is that Jeremy that's talking? Yeah, that's Jeremy yeah, talking. It is. So that's the merman right there that we were talking about that we saw a number of uh, pictures of in the video in that slideshow and who had that uh, that video in the beginning of that fish eating the dry fly under the trees you know what the way that it used to be down there and again I have only fished it for you know 20 some odd years so um, 
not a ton, but when I first started fishing the salmon fly hatch, around May 5th, 6th, something like that, you could go to the town of Maupin and start fishing downriver, like around Beaver Tail. And every day it would move upriver maybe two to three miles. And by Memorial Day, the hatch would, Memorial Day would be day one of the salmon fly hatch in the Warm Springs area. Uh, so Jeremy, your question, it was a lot longer and it would go, you know, till all the way through the 4th of July. And so you had a solid 30 days. Now, it maybe wouldn't have been, it was better in the sense that it lasted a lot longer. It was maybe yeah. not better like now, as you witnessed, we were having 100 fish days per person. That mm -hmm. wasn't happening like that. It wasn't, a, so it wasn't a spotty either. It was more, I mean, nowadays you seem to find, you know, pockets a lot of the time when you're going down the river. Yeah. It seemed like there was more consistency throughout the river and there was more of that natural progression, maybe from downstream upstream than there is now. I mean, there's still some of that progression, but it was more pronounced. Yeah, I like, remember how we skipped like a mile or two of river. Yeah. We were yeah. Floating. yeah. 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 So different, I mean, there's the bugs aren't any more or less prolific. The fish don't eat them maybe any more or less. Uh, just it doesn't last as long. Mm -hmm. Josh. Mm -hmm. Josh? Yeah. I've been uh, fishing the salmon fly hatch since 1980. And Ooh. what I found in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, my wife used to require that I bring one trout home. Uh, and and I think it was mostly to prove that I was actually gone fishing and not doing something <laughs> else. But uh, uh, and and I don't particularly care to eat trout, so I'd try to bring one home. But you know the slot limits there, ten to thirteen inches, and in, during that period, I had to work really hard to catch a fish small enough uh, to be in the slot limit, and so that I could actually take her one home. And that was over three days of fishing. And uh, whereas now I find that even though you know there's still plenty of fish around um, I found the average size has really dropped quite a bit that's not to say you can't catch big ones like your pictures attest but, uh, but, I, but back in those days I think the one thing I noticed different is not only did we have a lot of 60 to 100 fish days but they were all big they were all the big red size side size fish yeah that's a good observation and it's you know the, obviously there's two more than two but there's a couple things that i always wonder um one of course at that time from the 80s forward right is around the time when they really started doing that stringent regulation change of because fishing had been depleted essentially right and so there was a lesser population hence that kind of slot limit that they had implemented uh, to, to do that. Um, the other part is, you know, a lot of times when there's an overabundance of fish that, you know, <laughs> they don't have the feeding time, they're fighting for um, the resource that there is. Uh, I'm not, I don't know if there is more or less bugs or what the, um, uh, that nutrient load is now. Uh, but these would be interesting questions to have Rick here for, basically. You know, I started fishing a salmon fly hatch in about 1970-something, 71, 72. And um, what was interesting is to see the transition of the flies that we use, because back then, you know, flies like uh, uh, the falk or, uh, uh, you know, stimulator, those types of flies were really, we didn't have, we weren't tying with foam. So it was, it's a totally different thing. Uh, but my family used a fly called the Falk, which you can find in Randy Stetzer's book on uh, 
uh, best 1000 patterns or whatever, but uh, um, it was a fly that my grandfather created. So it's, that was the standard issue, you know, salmon fly. Uh, we got a question from Mike. He says, any boating tips or how to's you can share? There actually is a tip that I have for um, boating, fishing for the salmon fly hatch. You know, a lot of times when we're floating, maybe that's a, a multi-part tip. A lot of times when we're floating, especially myself, I'm trying to keep my eyes peeled under the, the trees and bushes and I'm looking for fish coming up and eating flies. Um, I'm trying not to run too tight to the bank because I don't want to run over those fish. Uh, but I'm positioning myself in such a way that when I see that happen, I can quickly ferry to that bank, um, typically downstream of it, so I can make an approach from the bottom up. And so a lot of times when I am floating, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about constantly is that making that move so I can get into position when I see a fish come up that I'm not going to run it over um, and that I can make a stealthy approach uh, in, into where it's at. Well, everybody, any other questions? Just wanted to say thanks. Thank yeah, you. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, yeah, Josh. Josh. Thanks, guys. This was awesome. Thank you, yeah. everybody. That was great. Yes. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Yeah, from uh, from Josh and Nick and Jennifer and myself, I want to thank everybody for uh, continuing to support the shop, and uh, we'll see y'all next Saturday. I don't know what this presentation. I'm working on some uh, several different ones right now, so we'll see what we, we finally finalize. But we'll have something next week. <laughs>